to kick off a little bit, my name is Malcolm Ross. I'm with Appian Corporation. I'm the head of product strategy for Appian. And let me get into my screen share here. So hope everyone is doing well. Cool. So how's everyone doing? Uh, can you hear me uh, or see my screen? Great. Well, feel free to interrupt me if you have questions. I think uh, I reviewed some of the topics that you've seen before as far as uh, presentations in this uh, session. I think it's going to be a little bit different uh, because I've seen you've covered like artificial intelligence and design techniques for web. Um, my experience is I have over 30 years experience in software development and I lead product strategy and the deputy chief technology officer for a publicly traded company here called Appian. So give a little bit about my background, kind of where I come from, and my recommendations as you think about in a career in computer software, computer software engineering. Uh, that's a picture of me from uh, when I was in high school, pre-college, and some of my early interests of kind of what I was interested in, it got me into software, but primarily I was interested in speech and debate. I did a lot of Lincoln-Douglas debate, extemporaneous speaking, Brass ensemble, specialized in trombone, baritone, jazz band, things like this. Yes. Law, I spent a lot of time in my high school times in a, in a program called Sirius Teen Court, where I was actually uh, representing clients, in a sense, to say, in a, in a mock defense uh, legal battles. So when people were actually arrested, when people below the age of 18 were arrested for things like shoplifting, they had an option to either go to juvenile court or to teen court. And when they went to teen court, they were uh, tried in a, a court of their peers, which was actually represented by uh, the lawyers, both for the, the defendant and the uh, plaintiffs were basically other teenagers, such as myself, who were basically prosecuting those. Uh, I was a big tennis player, grew up in South Florida. And then finally, last on my list was computer software. So I got into computer software development when I was about 11 years old. Uh, I got my first IBM PS1 computer. Uh, the first language I taught was ma uh, learned was MASM. If you know MASM, that's Microsoft Assembler. And I learned that because I was interested in software and I didn't know what it was. So I decompiled a number of software applications from the mid 80s and taught myself assembler language as far as to understand how software is made and then kind of grew from there. But I never realized it was a career for a long time and got into primarily in college first law, speech and debates where I thought I wanted, but ended up getting a computer information science degree. So kind of get a, a feel for my career. You know, I got into software development just as a hobby in the late mid 80s. But then when I was about 16 years old in 1991, started actually doing software development for a mortgage corporation, creating a wholesale mortgage rates tracking solution. Uh, you know, worked in university computer labs when I was 19, uh, worked for ID on credit card services, building a TQN database, so total quality management tracking call center operations, uh, tutored math, uh, anywhere from algebra to discrete mathematics and calculus. And then also worked in the, uh, I went to Florida State University. I got my college of uh, or computer science, computer information science degree from there. And while I was actually going there as well, I also did software development for the College of Law, doing a uh, accounting uh, financial tracking system for them. So kind of a so software development for me was a hobby for a while until it became kind of my primary thing. And then as I got into later parts of my postgraduate degree career, I wanted to explore a lot of the areas of software other than that, such as uh, network architecture. So I spent about two, two and a half years in network architecture consulting. This is kind of doing packet analysis, network optimization, working at Fannie Mae, Marriott, JP Morgan as a consultant in different organizations. And then in the late 90s, got into e-commerce software, you know, worked uh, with a corporation called OneSoft Corporation. We built uh, blackanddecker.com, Lowe's.com, major e-commerce uh, sites. So kind of like the very initiate, initial point of e-commerce and kind of innovation around how you build e-commerce websites and deliver those and also work for broad vision in a similar sense. And over the past uh, 17 years, I've been working in process automation, uh, which is basically applications in a, in a low-code design technique as well of artificial intelligence, business process management, robotic process automation, 
uh, intelligent document processing, all these technologies that enterprises use to basically do process orchestration across, uh, across their businesses and grew into a number of roles across there. The thing I probably want to take you uh, take away from this is the most influential parts, the things that advanced my career the most were not necessarily computers. It, I had a underlying passion for computer software and computer engineering, but the most influential parts were actually my investments and in time in law and speech and debate and other areas which complement and round off your, uh, your overall uh, career capabilities. And I think you'll find a, a lot of people can go to Barnes and Noble and buy a book about JavaScripting or design techniques, but it's around the long-term careers about combining software engineering with other skill sets to provide unique awareness of what industries need and solutions you can deliver for them. So it's my initial recommendation, I would say, is thinking about your own career. So uh, currently I find myself in the role of the head of product strategy for a corporation called Appian. If you're not familiar with Appian, I'll, I'll get to a slide there uh, in a minute. But essentially what I do is I do market research, competitive intelligence, uh, analyst relations. So I maintain uh, Appian's relationships with other industry analysts in the computer software industry. So these are organizations like Gartner, Forrester, IDC, who analyze overall trends in the market, as well as I participate in product designs, rapid prototyping. I run the main team that does rapid prototyping and development of new solutions, defining the product vision, and also acting as this product spokesperson. So when it comes to uh, main stage presentations, uh, anywhere from like major marketing events to also legal cases when I represent the company in uh, legal disputes or other areas uh, that we operate in a business function as well. So Appian, of course, uh, if you haven't heard of us, we are uh, low-code automation. So if you go to appian.com, you can see more about us, but we were founded in 99, uh, IPO'd in 2017. Uh, growing about 40, 44% year over year, 1,800 employees. So pretty uh, good sized organization uh, doing, uh, I think just under 400 million or so, $400 million in revenue uh, per year uh, with a multi-billion dollar market cap uh, capitalization. And specialized, as I said, in two primary areas, low-code development. And low-code development is how do I get people who don't have degrees in computer science to effectively build software? And it's uh, a very, skillful art of product management of how you design software solutions to make them approachable to not lay people to build effective scalable software solutions and that includes user experience design it includes back-end service architecture data architecture design things like this and there's a lot of innovations that appian does on all those spectrums to make it approachable and the reason we do that is because as you probably know Learning how to do software development is hard, especially not only the design techniques, but also optimization and also there's just the syntax of all the languages. So low code is all about kind of rather than teaching people how to talk to computers by teaching them syntax, it's about teaching computers how to talk to people, how to allow a computer to understand the intent of a person of what you want to do. And we use a variety of techniques in that uh, approach. We use obviously declarative design architectures, functional design architectures. We use artificial intelligence. We use all sorts of techniques to allow a human more easily express to a computer what they want an application to do in their terms and then have the, uh, the software effectively do it for them at scale as well. So. The specific solution investments that we focus on are things like artificial intelligence, as I mentioned before, specifically in the areas of uh, document processing. So ingestion of you know, unstructured content and turning the structured information, especially with image recognition. The other area of artificial intelligence we focus on is data architecture optimization. Uh, if you're familiar with data architectures like relational databases, document object stores, vector columnar data stores, time series databases, there's a lot of complexity to data architecture. And using artificial intelligence to automatically optimize uh, data architectures based on usage patterns. So detecting how people want to work with a solution and then automatically morphing data architectures to it. Robotic process automation, of course, is employing robots in order to actually do repetitive human tasks. 
rules, business rule logic is essentially uh, defining individual unit logic, such as you know, a, a calculation, for that example, a tax calculation, but again, employing methods that are low code, such as a, a decision table or artificial intelligence. How do I make it easy for a layperson to express logic? Analytics and reporting, digital engagement, such as communication, chatbots, document processing, mobile interfaces. Heard a little bit of talk about that before. Automatic optimization for different uh, layouts user experience design, process architecture, such as workflow, how do I orchestrate work inside of a large enterprise? And finally, integration as well, how do I tap into third-party systems? And again, looking at all those from a low-code perspective as well, how do I make that easy for uh, people to build upon? What we do, who we do this for? Uh, typically major corporations, like Major League Baseball, uh, take them for example, uh, if you've ever, had an idea to maybe, maybe you have an original idea. If I want to have a baseball cap with a Yankees logo on it, and you want as a retail merchandiser, you want to bring that to market as a new product offering. Not to say that's already been done already, but you obviously have to go through Major League Baseball, who is the uh, holder of the New York Yankees logo, and you need to negotiate a contract with them. That entire contractual process of new retail product offerings that utilize Major League Baseball uh, logos goes through Appian as a contract review process. Basically, you need to route it through the appropriate people. They need to design basically the steps and the business rule logic and maybe using some artificial intelligence to automatically scan contract documents, look at keywords. So again, but Major League Baseball, I can imagine it's a bunch of baseball players and people managing baseball teams, not necessarily a place where you think of top tier computer software development possibly. So low code is really important for them to allow them to easily express it uh, as far as what their intent is. But you can see a variety of uh, implementations here like Dallas-Fort Worth, a major, one of the fourth largest airport in the world, Enterprise Rent-A-Car, Ryder, the largest trucking organization in the United States, uh, University of South Florida, DC Central Kitchen, which provides uh, food to the needy here in the Washington DC area. Uh, so it's how they just uh, take in donations of food and then distribute that food to the uh, people, uh, homeless people who are in need here in the DC metropolitan area. So a wide variety of purposes. So what I'm gonna cover here is a little bit of uh, introduction of what is product strategy. And you think about this from, a, you know, how do I go about conducting product strategy for a major corporation? And then going through one section of product strategies, ident uh, opportunity identification. It's probably the most important decision you'll make in a software development project is how are you gonna spend your time? You might have more knowledge than people, you might have more resources than people, but uh, you have the exact same amount of time as all your competitors and other people. So how you spend your time by identifying the right opportunity is one of the most important parts as far as before you start to engage in a software development project to know what you're gonna do, what the expected output is. And then some recommendations and some key learnings and summary with that. So if there are any questions, feel free to raise your hand or chime in. I'm happy to keep it interactive as well. And I see there's a chat going on as well. Let me, I see some yeses to confirmation that you see my screen. I'll leave the chat window open here as well. One second while I move my boxes around. So Appian's product strategy goal, as far as what we're trying to do is we're trying to drive innovation to protect Appian's market position and expand Appian's total addressable market or what we call the TAM and growth rate, the, uh, what we often called the CAGR as well. So as a software company, you know, the, the key to running a software company or managing a software company or growing one is all about that first word innovation. People invest in software because they're investing in innovation. They invest in that because they want to utilize the latest technology to drive their business goals or their corporate goals or their governmental goals for their citizens, or they want to do uh, whatever it might be. It's the most important thing to know that what you're selling or what you're offering is innovation, uh, the use of technology to improve people's lives. And when you think about that, you need to realize that you're never you're never in a business where you simply have a piece of property or have an asset and then you're just selling it over and over like uh, widgets or real estate. What you're selling is the promise of using technology to improve the future, which means that the, the patterns you need to adopt as far as a long term career is constant innovation, constantly driving new ideas 
and also replacing old ideas, not getting attached to your old ideas in that sense. So it's a mentality that you start to in, in, entail. How we deliver product strategy is kind of three main things. We receive a mission. Typically, we all have a boss in some sense, whether it's a, uh, a government body or whether it's a corporation. There's a mission to a specific organization, uh, whether it's you know uh, climate change is a mission. And then from the mission becomes a vision, which is a high level idea of how we want to achieve that, how we're going to execute to maybe solve climate change challenges or solve homeless uh, people, um, you know, poverty challenges. And that turns into a strategy that says from that mission, we have an idea how we're going to accomplish it. And then we need to figure out exactly the things that we're going to do to do that strategy. Now that has a whole long tail to it, involves tens of thousands of people possibly as far as execution of that strategy. But product strategy is at the point where we convert a mission to strategy. That's the goal is to basically go through these steps. We listen to the senior executives and leaders of an organization. We help them define a vision and then we translate that into a strategy. And then we help actualize that strategy by working with a larger organization inside the environment. So, what we do specifically inside Appian, you know, we have customers. Our customers have problems they want to solve. Our, our job is to listen to these customers, to be have a very close pulse on what's going out there in the market. Because the CEO, for example, these people who are relatively disconnected from the day-to-day -day operations, we are kind of the trusted source to say, okay, I'm going to go into the field. I'm going to gather this information. I'm going to give the honest review of what's actually going on in the marketplace. We also kind of combine with developers. In this case, it's the people who are actually going to execute the strategy, defining the targets, the user stories, the requirements. And we also, we work with those executives to understand what is the mission, the goals of the organizations and how we're starting to align that. So we're kind of a nexus between multiple organizations. If you look at Appian product strategy, uh, just my department inside the team, while there's just under 2,000 employees, uh, my department only has 12 employees. Uh, it's an extremely small department, but we touch every single other department. We don't really roll up neatly inside a larger hierarchy where there's hundreds of other people, but we traverse across our finance group, our legal group, our sales organization, our engineering software development organization, and we are able to talk the language of all these different organizations. Uh, again, we, so it's a multifaceted role in that, but we're grounded in software as far as how we do software development. So uh, what we're gonna talk about is just that first one uh, in this larger session, but there's a lot of other things that we do in product strategy. So identifying opportunities, what is again, the mission of the organization? How do we identify pain? And how do we gather market intelligence to do that? So I'm going to go into that specific section in detail in this, uh, in this lecture here. But of course, there's a lot more to it than just that as well. You know, discovery requirements planning. We work very closely with product management when we settle on the strategy, translate, translating that strategy to actual product designs, wireframing, prototyping, uh, building initial specs, you know, participating in active software development. That team of 12 people I have, half of that team essentially is expert software engineers who are full stack developers able to go across any element of a software solution, whether it requires data architecture design, service architecture, user experience. It's basically top tier software developers. And then the other half of that, uh, my 12 people, is a market analysts who are business analysts who understand financials, understand uh, business aspects as far as how we bring things to market as well. Uh, we also work, of course, with our sales executives. We also get very deeply involved into pricing, channel sales, partnerships, technology relationships, uh, directly leading a lot of technology relationships as well. But through that analysis, we're also going to find kind of recommendations for a go-to-market strategy. What is the price of your product? What is the margins of that product? How we're going to grow it over time? How do we utilize channel networks and sales networks to expand the sales of it? Uh, agile product development, a very big part of it as well. We build it, we acquire it. So uh, Appian has had done two acquisitions in the past two years. Uh, I personally worked on both of them, uh, but acquisitions are simply when we look at our mission, sometimes the mission is to acquire entirely different companies and bring it into the stack. So that means 
doing that investigation, going out there, looking at their software stack, tearing down their software stack very quickly, identifying the challenges, issues, investments you need to make, as well as the full financial review as well, and technology partnerships. When we decide on a strategy, uh, since product strategy is often the tip of a spear as far as the initial thrust into a specific market, we're very involved in the go-to-market planning of that as well. So how do we now activate these other 2,000 people to then focus on expanding the entire market share and monitor the execution of that over time as well? So there's no questions. Again, feel free to interrupt me if you so choose. But talking about identifying opportunities, uh, the most important thing is just to follow what we all know is probably is the scientific method. Hopefully this is not new to you, but anyone who's taken any basic science class is familiar with the, the basic concepts of the scientific method. The scientific method is all about asking questions. You, you go about planning a business strategy the same way you go about trying to do a scientific research. I pose questions and observations. If I produce this product, then I might expect X results. Is that possible? Uh, you know, you're trying to make these specific observations as potential go-to-market strategies, and these become future innovations. You then start to research that topic area. What's the viability of that specific area? How can I understand it better? And ultimately, you come up with a hypothesis. A hypothesis represents essentially, and I'm going to go through each of these in detail, uh, if I build product X, then I expect a result Y, right? So it's the same thing as a scientific method. If you do this specific test, then you expect this result. And then in order to test the hypotheses, we need to prove it. We need to go through and say, build rapid prototypes. We need to test it. We need to analyze the results and we need to report the conclusions. Once you go through this entire method, then you can formulate an actual recommendation of a strategy. So this is how you simply identify the early opportunities. And it's typically, this is where most corporations fail is a lack of rigor to this. Uh, because where most corporations fail, this is their strategy. I'm not sure if you ever heard this acronym before, but this is the HIPPO strategy, where the wealthiest person or the person in charge has decided this, and therefore everyone's going to do this. And this is what we call the HIPPO strategy, the highest paid person's opinion. And it's very tempting, especially for, you know, commercial organizations to try to you know, just do this. You know, there's a time pressures to say to capture market share. But oftentimes where corporations fail is they have simply an opinion for which they're kind of basing their entire business strategy on. And they're not actually basing it on actual market research to justify their investments and time. Kind of going back to my original point, time is your most precious commodity. Again, you and all your competitors have the same amount of time. We have our lives. We have 24 hours in a day. You can work maybe 20 hours of that day, sleep for four, uh, but everyone's time box by time. So how you choose to spend your time is the most important thing. And that scientific method is all about, whoops, let me go back up, jump the head here. That scientific method is how I understand how to best utilize your time across this. So let's go through kind of a scenario here. So here's a, a mission observation. So we have a, a few missions possibly here. So this is, these are real world missions that you know I've discussed with our senior executives and things that we believe kind of have goals. So we want to accelerate time to value for new customers. Okay, that, that's kind of a makes sense for any product, but specifically for us, it was how do I accelerate the time it takes for a customer to implement the Appian software stack and receive value from it? And the hype, there's a rough hypothesis there that, you know, if we can accelerate the time to value, then the customers will appreciate the value and invest more in the software. So there's kind of a, a rough uh, mission there. There's also things like how can I expand use cases addressable by the product? You know, maybe Appian can do artificial intelligence processing for this specific type of document. What if I expanded it to another set of documents or another? So these are going to kind of rough mission statements. We want to maybe target and expand customer adoption, a specific industry vertical. Well, what if I want to expand Appian into 
say, the life sciences industry, so in pharmaceutical research and drug manufacturing, uh, well, what are the requirements of that? So that maybe that's a rough mission that we get. Uh, and of course, maybe we're ready to respond to competitor innovations, pricing, packaging, maybe IBM, Microsoft, other competitors in the marketplace are coming up with something. And there's a rough kind of mission here to simply respond. This is typically about as much as I get. You know, if I meet with a CEO or other CXO, it's probably just what I get as far as initial meeting. Hey, this is going on. We'd like you to look into this. And this is kind of the rough mission. Let's just take one example here, which is kind of going through a real world example that we covered maybe not a decade ago, but you know, 2013, 2014, that we want to accelerate time to value for new customers. Uh, this should be a mission in almost any organization, whether you're a government organization or a, uh, or a commercial organization, providing value as quickly as possible is definitely going to help the business grow. So we start with this with asking maybe some questions, you know, what value do we hope to derive from accelerate time to value? So the first question I have to ask is like, okay, if we invest in this, if we accelerate the time to value, what do we expect as far as a rough idea? These are questions that then are posed to a product strategy organization that need to be answered. And then what are the challenges that inhibit the time to value? So why are our customers not receiving time to value right now? So again, another good question. And so we go from the mission to the questions and the questions now are gonna help derive our research strategies going forward. So it's like, okay, we have a value question and a challenges question. Now these are both technological questions as well as financial questions. So how are we gonna do this? So if we wanna accelerate time to value, well, we need to do some initial research. Probably gonna start with just talking to customers interviewing users, interviewing implementation professionals, and aggregating that knowledge together into a single, easily digestible uh, place. But more importantly, we also do walkthrough analysis. And this is more of a technological review that we will put ourselves in the, in the place of our customers, implementing our software, and document every single low-level step it takes. So where are the bottlenecks in that process? Where are the issues in that process? Uh, you know, you look at kind of user experience design, you look at overall training, uh, how, how to orient someone to your software, you look at data architecture design, maybe the, the, the maybe terminology, everything that maybe poses a challenge in that we do that walkthrough and we do walkthroughs in a variety of ways. Uh, but the goal is to basically detail, provide analysis of all the bottlenecks and uh, that inhibiting time to value. And then finally, we do a market analysis. So we need to understand if Appian is trying to accelerate time to value, every commercial organization typically has competitors. What are the competitors doing in this? How do we compare our time to value to our competitors? Is someone beating Appian's uh, uh, goal here? All these have to be kind of thoroughly analyzed for a period of time. And again, it's both a technological review as well as a kind of business review of these uh, goals. And then from there, we're going to come up with a hypothesis. So from that research we've conducted, we're going to say, well, maybe if we do these things, we can try to derive that value that previously we've researched and identified and then come up with a hypothesis to propose to solve it. So we're going to maybe say, as some examples, maybe we're going to simplify the product experience will result in improved time to value for customers. One possibility. Another one, adding prepackaged integrations to customer systems might accelerate time to value. So we know our software maybe requires integrations to other systems. Well, what if we prepackage those? Maybe that was a bottleneck we're gonna then uh, offer as well. But maybe it's not a technological problem at all. Maybe it's a distribution problem. Maybe we've been selling through resellers or other channel partners who create more uh, sales middleman who need to go through inhibiting time to value. So you need to really look at solutions, not just as technological solutions, but entire experience solutions. What is the entire experience, both the business experience as well as the technological experience and offer hypotheses that maybe solve those. So I have one example document that's gonna bring up here. This is uh, a document from not, not a decade ago, but maybe a little less than a decade ago which was basically exactly what I talked about before as far as accelerating time to value. Uh, our CEO expressed this as the two hour challenge that we were finding 
previously that a customer could not get their first implementation on the product. Maybe it took them, I think, as I remember, maybe a week or so. And he specifically challenged us to say, hey, I need, to, I need a solution that offers a time to value of two hours from installation to design of a product, a unique solution for that customer to then rolling it out in production inside a two hour window. That was kind of the mission. And it was kind of like, you know, a simple grab of the air. So we define this as a high level goal mission in two hours or less, build a tool that automates a simple but valuable customer process. So we wanna take a customer like Ryder, for example, who manages the largest trucking fleet in the United States. Say if you buy the Appian software, go through these steps, you will be able to maybe automate, say the a truck you know, rental process within two hours. You'll be able to build a new software application within two hours, roll it out to your entire enterprise and have it ready. And then basically go through who's the audience? Why are we doing this? Who are the key stakeholders? What is the output? You know, asking yourself some questions, you know, basically going through the whole skunk works of this, our strategic objectives. We want to maybe show this to prospects, increase the likelihood of uh, quick wins. So we want to demonstrate the value very quickly to our customers so they continue to invest in the solution. So it's kind of the, the thought process early on in a real world example of how Appian did this going through it. Let's go back to my deck here. So what did we do? So in running a product strategy organization, especially in a commercial organization, uh, time is very important. Uh, there's lots of time constraints. Uh, there's market opportunities that you need to jump on. Uh, another great example of that is Appian in uh, April of 2020, we released a COVID safe return and safe management of work uh, process or application rather. That's now adopted by several universities. It's adopted by major organizations like Pfizer, uh, who has a million users on the solution, who use it for the, the basically following proper safe protocols. Like I see people wearing masks right now making sure people are wearing masks, making sure you check in, you validate your health status before entering a facility. You can imagine rolling that out in April, 2020, there's a time pressure goal. COVID just hit in March, 2020. Uh, the entire world was responding to this. Companies who were able to respond quickly to a market opportunity capture more market share. So there's always that concept of time and understanding how time pressure plays into a market opportunity they need to be aware of. So in any of these, you set time goals for a prototype, uh, whether it needs to be very rapid or maybe more lengthy. You need to define clear questions to be answered as the outcome of the prototype, such as the ones we solve. What is the, uh, what is the challenges? What's the value? Uh, the, the challenge I see many people going down in a prototype is thinking a prototype needs to be a finished application when it doesn't. Uh, a prototype only needs to answer the questions that have been uh, uh, proposed to it based on a market opportunity. So you need to make sure you focus the prototype. Sometimes we talk about maybe user experience design. Do you need to go through a whole development on React of building a whole UX? Maybe not. Maybe you can just use a wireframe to convey the concepts of what you want to achieve while focusing more technical work on maybe back in architecture things. Another good example of that is, you know, uh, things that my team working on right now is cloud scale architectures. Well, what if we want to build a process engine or a scale architecture that is able to transact a million new instantiations of a process per second? So that's extremely high load. Uh, for top tier use cases, so such as maybe pe people filling out tax forms, buying the latest iPhone, extremely kind of high load environments. Uh, when we think about that, it's like, okay, the UX, I don't need to worry too much about. You know, that's going to be maybe simplistic and variable to based on the use case. The engine is what I need to worry about. So all the actual technical work is gonna be focused on that middle tier architecture as far as doing the actual scale load testing. So you need to make sure those questions are very pointed and the prototype answers those questions. Only develop to answer the questions at hand. As they say, use small teams, one to four developers. Typically what I have is one developer. Uh, again, the type of developers I typically work with uh, have MIT grads, you know, Stanford grads typically who work on my team. They're top tier computer scientists. I usually need to simply, usually all I need to give them is the questions. And they're able to work independently to simply build what's necessary to answer those questions. 
So small team architectures of a one to four are going to work fast, nimble, and drive to the specific areas. The more people you layer into it, the more complexity of communication you have, which then inhibits your first point, which is your time goals. So it's all about speed. And unlike product management, where you typically work in a, say, professional software development organization, you're going to find that a product manager is maybe going to document the requirements and then give it to a software developer and work maybe in an agile process through sprint cycles to deliver that in cycle. Not here, uh, you know, rapid prototyping, you simply pose the questions, had developers, top tier developers who can do that very efficiently, and they simply document as they build. So they're really not spending time documenting up front. They're just like intuitively know what to do. And then as they're going through the process, they document as they build because the goal of the documentation is to educate other people in the organization on the strategy, which we'll get to later. So uh, another good example, as we go through this, again, the two hour challenge, what you get is this. You get people at a bar, writing on napkins, designing architectures, designing flows, rapid iteration, rapid collaboration, small team architecture, in a Google Doc, whiteboard notes. I'm, I'm not going to translate to these what these actually mean, but essentially these are Skunk Works design architectures. You know, basically that small team, small collaborative team about what are the requirements, what are the use cases, how we're going to design it, what's maybe some design patterns, breaking it out uh, into these architecture designs. So going on. <clears throat> After that, analyze the questions or analyze the data. Were the questions answered? That's number one goal of a prototype. Answer the questions. Make sure that we have an understanding of whether the strategy is valid or not. Because again, it's a scientific method. Your job is to prove or disprove the hypotheses. And taking a very honest opinion of disapproval of the hypotheses is a very valid result. So you want to make sure that you don't bias it towards proof. Um, people have their opinions that they're really passionate about a specific you know, thing, but then you're, if you're disproving either technology, whether it's feasible or whether there's actually a financial market that's addressable, it needs to be disproved in that sense. And then summarize the results so it can be easily reviewed by other stakeholders. Because when you're working in a large corporation, you're now getting to the point where you need to manipulate the opinions of other people, which means about it's all about communication, uh, effective communication strategies. So reviewing things effectively or summarizing things effectively so that it can be easily reviewed by others. You know, I have a lot of techniques I use as far as when I want to convey information, such as boiling down English. When you write sentences, use third grade English. If you can remember what third grade English was like, it was very simple, you know, noun object verb or noun verb object. It's very simple sentence structures, not complex sentence structures. So it's going to be easily digested and quickly digested. Bullet points, One, if you're doing a presentation, one point per slide, don't convey multiple points into a single slide. Make it easy to consume the information in a measured manner. It's also important when people are making very important decisions around their business strategies that they fully understand each point before moving on. So I'd like to, again, recommendations as far as simplifying the uh, communication language there, as far as how we convey these complex designs. And then reporting the conclusions. So in every organization, you need to identify the key stakeholders for which a conclusion impacts. Uh, as I mentioned, the conclusions are not always technical. Sometimes the conclusions are based on pricing strategies, maybe they're packaging, distribution channels, other things around business impact. So if you have something that impacts our finance organization, accounting organization, services delivery, you need to identify those stakeholders and involve them in the process. <clears throat> and develop and execute a briefing plan for key stakeholders. So as you start to communicate this out and then correlate recommendations to TAM and CAGR. So this is specifically, if you intend to work for a commercial organization, two key acronyms here, TAM, total addressable market, and CAGR, compound annual growth rate. <clears throat> if you're trying to uh, create a startup, for example, and you want to receive a venture capital funding, you're going to need to know those terms uh, because the venture capitalist wants to know what's the potential size of this organization, how big is the addressable market, and if it's addressable, how quickly does it grow? Is there projected growth in the future? So a good example is take uh, solutions for COVID-19 safe return to work. What's the total addressable market? 
well, pretty much every corporation, university, or government body in the world who needs to manage health protocol guidelines for their uh, students or you know employees returning to a physical facility. So pretty big. What's a compound annual growth rate? Well, that's interesting because in April 2020, it seemed like it was going to go from zero to a, like a, a billion percent overnight. But then there's also a projection that says, well, most people are going to have this figured out within the first one or two years. <clears throat> so the compound growth rate of that specific market is going to be extremely high in a very short period of time. And then most people are going to have a solution which are going to settle on for COVID-19 uh, protocol management. Uh, so there's a really tight window market share. <clears throat> so you want to make sure you understand these terms and understand that you're measuring these against new initiatives. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, um, as it goes into strategy, you then want to have some thought brought up around go-to-market questions. How do how exactly do we start bringing this to market? You know, channel partners, pricing, things like this, recommendations. <clears throat> you know, you know, I'm covering this at a very very high level, but. Uh, Try to give you some some examples of results. So Appian endeavored in this as far as evolving our product to be low code specific, specifically trying to evolve it to be focused on an architecture that was addressable to the layperson to build solutions. And this market got hot. Hi, this is PC and then you have Rob, coverage Lab, like this. Today we're testing low code, <clears throat> no code app development platforms. These are tools you can use to create a working app using no coding at all. This is just drag and drop interfaces, filling out forms. And today we're testing whether these platforms can actually do that. We've got four developers right behind me from Ziff Davis Tech, and they are gonna test four different platforms. We've got one from Microsoft, one from Salesforce, Appian, and Zoho. We'll see whether they can actually create low code, no code apps in one hour. Today we're gonna test these platforms by building a basic scheduling app. Gentlemen, start your builder. Hey, this is Giacomo, and I'm using Appian Design. <laughs> quick apps like low code, no code, it was like a, a very good experience. I was like uh, kind of happy. Everything was fast, and like I use like uh, Appian Designer. Um, the cool feature is that there is like uh, two ways to create an app. So there is like the quick one and the full design one. So I create the, the form with the quick one and it took really like uh, less than 10 minutes. Here you can create a new task and there are fields that, that are already like mapped and linked to data entry behind. So it was super easy. And uh, with this view, you have like the list of tasks that are in chronological order, and uh, you can go and for every task, there is really this view created so you can update, modify everything. And uh, you can also have like some report that that's just a basic report of number of tasks. So I added this one and create like a send, a send email where you can actually from the you can drag and drop from here and create a send email then. And uh, so to achieve something like a scheduling app, so I think it was like kind of easy. So I think that that can work like actually in business where, you know, you need to create some app that can handle business process or product process, stuff like that. It looks like Appian, like you can, you can do it easier without any code skill. So that's just a uh, review by PC Magazine. So one second. Hi, this is PC Magazine. Pause that again. So that's the goal, you know, when you launch these into actual market, achieving market recognition, doing marketing outbound campaigns, and then practice strategy leads into this as far as the whole go-to-market rollout to drive this awareness, participate with independent bodies like uh, magazines, periodicals, Forbes, Wall Street Journal, things like this to raise awareness of the offering. And then, of course, the result of this was, you know, we had an IPO in 2017. Uh, Matt Calkins, my boss here, became a billionaire. And basically that's the end goal, right? To, uh, through effective product strategies is to drive kind of that mass adoption, mass awareness of the entire product offering. So in summary, kind of going back to where I started, what were some of the most important things that I learned? You know, as I said, I've, I've 30 years, over 30 years experience in just software development. And, you know, JavaScript and React and these technologies are all great to know and to know, but uh, it wasn't what distinguished my career. 
it was really around the, the pairing of that computer science knowledge with other knowledge. So you just need to think about yourself, you know, computer software is applicable to so many areas, whether you're going to specialize in, you know, research and development in like life sciences or mechanical engineering or robotics. It's about pairing that knowledge of software development with another complementary area. And that's where you get the magic effect of providing this massive value to whatever organization you're going into. The things for me that uh, were influential for me was just messaging, uh, you know, how you bring products to market. And these are things that I, I kind of follow the Bible with very much as far as when I specific want, specifically want to message a new product initiative, there's five fundamental things you have to do. You have to define the challenge. You know, why are you doing this? What's at stake? Second, why are you the solution? Is this sampling different in the marketplace as well? As you see down point three, how will we do it? What is the actual technical features that we're going to incorporate? And then what will we achieve? What is the results we're trying to accomplish? And then summarizing that essential promise. So you think about that statement I made earlier about summarizing results, summarizing initiatives. You really want to follow this pattern to have a deep understanding of what exactly is the problem you're trying to solve. How are you different? Most people who are overly technical jump right to point three here. <clears throat> they simply talk about the technology. They, oh, this new software tool does this. I'm going to build it and do this. But they forget to communicate the value and the returns that everyone cares about. Whether you're trying to do something, again, for climate change or for poverty awareness, you need to follow a messaging architecture that clearly communicates what you're doing to other people. Uh, presentation structure. You know, as you're presenting your ideas to other people, I, I assume at some point you're going to want to come up with an original idea on your own. You want to sell that to maybe get a government grant for research at a university. You're going to want to get venture capital funding. You're going to want to convince a boss at a corporation to invest in a project. You need to do these, uh, this structure. And this presentation structure is very simple. Very first thing is you got to engage your audience. If you don't have your audience's attention, you're wasting everyone's time. So you want to make sure that there's some attention step, that you have some type of engagement uh, to make sure you, you have their attention and not, not in a distracted fashion. You want to review what you're going to be telling someone, summarize three to five points, your talking points, and then you want to cover it each talking point. And then you want to go back to the agenda and re-review what you just told them to validate the understanding of what you just communicated. So again, this is a kind of a core presentation structure. You're not taught in computer science classes, taught in other classes you might take around presentation, but it's very important to communicate effectively to make sure that your time is well spent on projects that receive the backing of the people you need to back it. Another really key thing to me was a lot of sales training that I took in the, my entire career as well. One of these was something called Sandler sales training. And Sandler is a sales methodology. You can check it out, sandler.com, which basically tells you how to, again, correlate what you're working on with value to an individual. Again, most technical people, computer science people, focus on what I would call as level one pain. I have a technical problem. I'm going to solve you a technical solution. What you'll find is a level one pain, that first level of pain, gets very little investment by anyone because it's just a technical problem. I don't understand the value of solving it. It just seems like, oh, there's a technical issue. I'm going to solve it. As you move up the chain, you can then start to correlate maybe, well, if I solve this problem, it has this impact on an organization. Maybe the corporation is going to be more efficient. Maybe the government is going to be better servicing citizens. Well, great. You know, I have a general affiliation with a corporation or government body I work with. So yeah, I have a, a general goal of meeting that but it's not going to motivate me to act quickly. The next level of pain is what we call third level pain, impact on the individual. So my bonus is specifically tied to achieving this business goal. So therefore, I'm much more personally incentivized to invest in your specific idea because it hits third level pain. So understanding the correlation of your maybe solution you want to come up with, with the goals of who you're trying to get to invest in it, is a very important part. And then at the very bottom, fourth level pain, the person's emotionally involved in feeling the pain. For example, you want to 
invest in a new technology which helps you know people recover from cancer or chemotherapy. And maybe the people you're trying to offer it to have experienced this in a very personal way. Or maybe you're trying to solve climate change and the people are very emotional and they feel the impact of climate change issues. So this is all about a messaging architecture and how to correlate what you're doing to specifically the value, again, of who you're trying to deliver to. So Sandler, very influential in my career. Another great one is also what's called challenger selling. Challenger selling is also a method of communication to challenge people's perceptions and get them to think about innovation and investing in innovation as well. So again, you want to teach, you want to become an expert in the topic for which you're investing your time in and be that authority for which you want to uh, be relied upon by other people. You want to tailor for resonance. You want to link your capabilities to customer individual goals and outcomes. So similar to that Sandler stuff. And then also you want to assert control. You want to openly pursue goals in a direct but not aggressive way. You want to have goals in mind as far as what your development goals are and how you pursue it. So this is very, very high level. But again, there's lots of material on the internet. You can read about Sandler sales training, challenger sales training as a recommendation. Value selling is another one I'd highly recommend, valueselling.com. Basically, it's a way of just laying this out in a simple spreadsheet. What's the issue you're trying to uh, uh, solve? What exactly is the problem that's caused by this issue? What's the solution? What's the value? And what's your plan and the stakeholders involved in this? So you see a lot of this basically packaged up in different ways. It's all about correlating your time and investments in IT investment into value that's gonna be delivered and recognizing who the stakeholders are and making that become a reality. So in summary, hope you appreciate this. This is uh, what a person does in product strategy uh, as far as you know, driving you know, new investments, innovation inside a corporation. It is technical in some sense. Again, I'm a lifelong computer scientist myself, but it goes way beyond that as well. And I think it's a, it's a great career to look at as far as when we think about as you get out of college, you want to people to invest in your ideas. You, you need to have that broad perspective around it. So hope you found this useful and happy to uh, take any questions we have in the final few minutes here. Uh, so there's a, a question here in the chat. So thanks for the talk. How technical are people who use Appian deploy the full product in two hours? So the, the goal I set, so we have different experiences, as you saw from that PC Magazine video. We have what we call a quick apps version, which I would say is completely non-technical. It is essentially putting software design for a specific purpose of process workflow case management on Rails, that they simply fill in information. They fill in what's the data I want to capture, what are maybe some of the key information of what they fill out, and they hit next and hit publish, and it creates the application for them completely hands off. So it's a way of generating software with someone who literally knows nothing about software. Now, the full designer experience, we, we talk a lot about personas. And you always want to think about personas when you're designing a user experience as who exactly is the person I'm trying to design this for? What is their level of knowledge and capability when interacting with it? And when we talk, think about that, we often point to like the Microsoft Office suite, so or the Google suite, for example, someone who can create an interesting spreadsheet or a simple database or interesting kind of a Word document, maybe with a little bit of limited dynamic logic. That's kind of like the target persona of who we target to kind of build in the full happy design experience. Uh, but as a general rule, persona is so important when thinking about who's going to use your software and designing it to that person. <clears throat> Uh, so yeah, I mean, well, how do we go, this is another question, how do we go about bringing together business and computer science oriented people in a team who usually don't hand, uh, around same circles, uh, you know, computer scientists and business users, uh, belong together like peanut butter and jelly, we'll say when they're separate, you have a disaster. <clears throat> you typically have business who is aligned with achieving business goals and computer scientists align with achieving technical goals. When those two are not aligned to a specific shared mission, what you have is a dysfunctional organization. So who's responsible for setting up that is basically the management structure of any organization. Or if you're working on your own project, 
you should be specifically seeking out business experts. Um, you know, I was talking to uh, the CIO of the, uh, I think it was the major water organization. So the, uh, responsible for water distribution in the state of Michigan. And, you know, what was key to them is when they had computer software professionals that you take that computer scientist and you actually take that person and you put them in the sewer system. You take that person and you actually say, well, this is, there's a person's job in the state of Michigan whose job is to maintain the cleanliness of the sewer systems and the water lines. And you take that computer scientist and you make them go in that role. So if it involves like literally putting on a, a jumpsuit with protective gear and getting into the sewer pipes, it means that because the job of the computer scientists is to understand that the business people's jobs, your citizens, you, your citizens' jobs and drive innovation that helps them have a better life. So you can't do that from an ivory tower sitting inside you know, behind your computer screen. So if you're not doing it yourself, you need to be reaching out to the world, understanding how the world works. And then your unique value to the world is your knowledge of software and how you apply that by working with these people, if that makes sense. So how it's done, you know, there's specific methodologies like agile methodology, which combines business and computer scientists together. But how it's also done is just the will of the, the people participating on the teams themselves. <clears throat> um, really excited about Appy. What's the process of applying for an internship and what are the chances of having taken, uh, after having taken Web Lab? Uh, I'll follow up. We work with our campus recruiters at MIT and we have a very much active internship program. So we're really happy to get interns on. Uh, but we'll follow up. I'll make sure our recruiter maybe provides the information to follow up. And of course, you can email me directly here at the malcolm.ross at appy.com. If you have some interest, I'd be happy to reply to you and forward you to the right person. Uh, so what kind of work do interns do? Typically, uh, computer scientists interns work with our uh, software development organization, what we call our engineering organization. So those challenges that we talked about before, specifically around how do I build a software design experience, which is approachable by lay people. That's specifically where we have our computer scientists interns work in working with our product managers to understand design analysis of how, you know, how lay people who don't understand computer software think and then build solutions that help them accomplish those things. So a great example of this is, you know, just simply user experience. It's a very high level thing. A very advanced example of this is like, uh, I'm not sure if anyone's done uh, computing for parallel architectures. So if you design a software solution and you're using a multi-core CPU environment, how do I in, in make sure that I'm using parallelism across those multiple cores to optimize the performance of any logic I create? So the, the par designing for parallel computing is usually an advanced kind of master's or doctorate level computer science type action, but it's very necessary when thinking of building solutions at scale to maximize utilization of CPU cores. So we have our very advanced computer scientists who have patents on this, who've created basically static analysis of software that's designed in the Appian product automatic identification of parallelism and then automatic parallelization of any software solution built in the product so that we will automatically detect the hardware configuration, the number of cores inside that environment. And we will automatically look at the express designs of the software and without any input from the user, optimize that for parallel computing across multi-core CPUs. So that's a very advanced area that you might be involved in as far as that whole idea, that whole mindset of how do I build things so the lay people can take the full advantage of software, doing these complex things behind the scenes that typically a, a advanced computer scientist needs to do should be done automatically. And that's kind of like a project we would work on. So any other questions or comments? If not, I, I will pass the ball back to your organization and appreciate the time. And thank you everyone for uh, joining. Uh, there's another question. Would you be able to go back to the messaging architecture slide? Yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, this one, I assume. And yeah, I'm happy to uh, make these slides available. Uh, I'll work with our, our, you know, our appian representatives as well, the recruiters to uh, distribute this. So thanks everyone for the time and have a great day.